Okay, this is a call out to my listeners. I do not have a lot of sponsors for this podcast on purpose because I don't want to waste your time with products I am not crazy about. Well, I do have two that I am crazy about. The first one is LLC TLC. This is where you can save money on your car registration every year. You can set up a Montana LLC and pay no sales tax on your vehicle purchases, which is really amazing. Now, you can also permanently register your classic cars in Montana to avoid any annual renewal fees. And as your registered agent, LLC TLC will handle everything for you so you never have to step foot in Montana to take advantage of this incredible offer. Now, as a listener of this podcast, they are offering 30% off your entire package. Now, to get this, simply go to LLCTLC.com slash classic or mention this podcast when you call them directly my other big sponsor of this podcast is euro classics out of dayton ohio now that's euro classic with an x.com if you want to reach them in person you can reach them at 937-299-1311 now this is where i get all of the work done on my porsche i just had uh, my gto in there my mustang's been in there it is the place to go if you want awesome service at an extremely competitive price so when you go there, just ask for Dale and tell him that I sent you. Hey, it's Greg Stanley with the Collector Car Podcast. I am very excited about our guest today because we've been talking for a couple of years now, but this is your first time on the podcast. So I'd like to welcome Samantha Zimmerman. Samantha, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you doing today, Greg? Good, good. And I don't know if you know this, but I'm a wannabe artist. And so when I ran into <laughs> you a couple of years ago at Amelia Island, I loved your stuff. I just thought it was amazing stuff. And Mostly out of jealousy is why I was so, uh, oh, I thought it was so cool. <laughs> so um, I'll put some cool pictures if you're watching on YouTube um, of your, your paintings. But if you would, tell us a little bit about what you do and kind of how you got involved in it. So I am primarily a um, motorsport artist, but I also do automotive work as well, as you've seen from my stuff at Amelia. But I typically work in oil paint and graphite, so I'll do realistic teetering on hyper-realistic pieces of art at this point. Usually my subject matter consists of motorsport from the golden age of motorsport, if you will, so like your 70s, 80s, 90s, um, driver portraits, you know, even street cars here and there mixed in, but as far as my beginnings go, so I grew up in Southern Virginia, so Chesapeake Bay area, and half of my family was from Annapolis, so I spent some time up in there. Um, my grandparents' house was literally right down the road, or the river, rather, from the Naval Academy, so... I grew up with a mix of a military background in that regard in the Air Force and uh, in a household full of NASA and Lockheed Martin engineers and technical <laughs> drawers. So I was always really interested in art, but I never took it super seriously as something I wanted to do as a career until I got a little bit older. So I'd say I'd be doing, I've been doing my art maybe around 10 years full time. You know, growing up, Formula One on Sundays was a staple. And my grandfather actually in Annapolis had a Testarossa. And he nicknamed it Yellow Bird because it was fly yellow. And I think the leather color is, um, I think I want to say that it was Magnolia over Magnolia, if I'm not mistaken, or something along those lines. Anyway, it's a light tan. Um, but it lives down here in South Florida. So eventually maybe I can get my hands back on it. Um, <laughs> ironically, it went through RM back in 2020 at the Palm beach auction or West Palm auction, okay. but regardless. So the bug for cars has been in the family my entire life and for racing as well, but I really didn't get crazy into it until you know, I sort of fell out of it with my parents splitting up. Um, but I didn't really get crazy into it until my husband took me to my first EMSA race over 10 years ago. Took me into 24 hours of Daytona. Clearly, it's all been downhill since then because, <laughs> you know, um, that's all I seem to paint and draw now. But it's what I love to do. So I couldn't complain at all about having the super cool job I do now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, when I remember, and this was this was like 
a couple elevations, evolutions of a stick figure. I remember my mom would draw cars for me, like profile view, real boxy. And it just resonated with me for some reason. And I started mm -hmm. wanting to draw. And I was probably like four or five years old at the time. Is, do you have any mm -hmm. memories like that when you first your, saw your first technical drawing and you were like, holy crap. And if, if so, like what was that first drawing where you, you kind of grabbed your attention? So funny enough, it wasn't even cars. I remember being that Lockheed is Lockheed and NASA is NASA. I wasn't necessarily able to see drawings per se that my folks were working on. <laughs> but I remember um, when I was a kid, my grandma took me there and it was like, bring your daughter, kid, kid, brother, whatever to work day. And we're at NASA and this was at Hampton Roads and the, um, the NASA <laughs> facility in Hampton Roads tests, if I'm not mistaken, it tests the landing gear of the shuttles. Um, so they have like a big splash pad and all that jazz that goes on there. Um, but I remember going one day and there's partly a museum there. And I looked and I saw all these technical drawings of like B-17s and all sorts of amazing aircraft. Like, honestly, I'm not as savvy with my aircraft lingo as my husband is, but regardless, like, it was so cool to see that and how precise everything was. And my grandma and my dad would go on to say, you know, everything was hand drawn. We didn't do anything with computers back in the day. Whereas, you know, you have AutoCAD and things like that now. And from that point on, I think the love for all things super precise in nature as far as drawing was considered was born. And then on top of it, my grandmother and my grandfather and my dad's side were really heavily involved in PCA. So every time I spent time with her, she'd take me out on her 944 and she'd take uh -huh. me on these super twisty roads in Virginia and I'd be squealing like a kid in, in the passenger seat. I think from that point on was really some of my earliest memories of starting to really develop a love for cars in general and aviation. Right. Yeah. And you got the Porsche bug a little bit too, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. No, we, it's, it's honestly, it's an illness. Oh my gosh. Like <laughs> we've had our fair share of nine, six, fours through the house. And, um, and we just had a nine, nine, seven recent was our most recent car that we had or Porsche wow. that we had. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I love the technical background because when I look at your paintings, they're so grounded in realism, meaning like the, the proportions are absolutely perfect. But what's cool is your use of uh, light and tell me how you blur stuff. Because I'm like, do you just take your hand and you go, whoop? And I'm like, how do you do that? Where the background's blurry, it captures the speed of the car. You've got the very precisely drawn wheels but they're spinning at 120 miles an hour mm -hmm. yet you capture that you don't have to go deep dive here but kind of like overall like how do you capture movement in your paintings so that i think that's probably one of my more notable signatures in my work is that i always include some kind of movement in my work and i really want people that are looking at the work to feel like they're standing right there and their eyes can follow the car as it's going. When I'm working on a soft focus or a motion blur background, it's a lot of blending, blending on blending on blending. I wish I could make it easy enough to where I could take a giant brush and just smear the whole thing. But there's right. so much gradation that happens between different buildings in the background and different colors of the sky. I've got a GT1 I'm working on right now, Champions GT1, that's at Sebring. And in the background, you can see there's a bunch of campers and fans and things along those lines. And it's really going color by color blending each section into the next section so there's i don't take any shortcuts i wish i could but i never do <laughs> <laughs> wow okay well and i don't i haven't said this yet but your website samantha zimmerman art.com so be sure to check that out and i'll have some pictures flown on youtube very very cool the other thing i noticed and i don't see this uh, to me it's one of the things that stands out the most if you see an automotive artist if they're not quite up to your level is your cars have gravity to them and you know, you could feel the weight of these cars, even though it's a two D dimension, you know, two dimensional, yeah. 
image. How yeah. is it all about light and shadow? Is that what it is? The stance on the wheels? How do you do that? So I think most importantly, when you're talking about any piece of artwork, especially that's realistic, value and mixing or creating a palette that's super dynamic is probably the most fundamentally important part of the piece. Contrast, yes. Um, but I think probably one of the most useful tools I have or I utilize is mixing up a palette with using limited amounts of black and limited amounts of white. And by mixing, say, if you want a an almost, what did I just do? I just did frozen berry. So when I was making this frozen berry car, I used purple, blue, crimson, and a little bit of white just to make it lighter, but avoiding making colors solely based off of white or black is mm. so important because it flattens it and it doesn't give it as much depth. Mm. Okay. I Sorry. like that because a lot of no, no, <laughs> a lot of times you look at a black, it's not black. You know, there's purples mm -hmm. and dark blues or oranges or something else in it, you know, so that, that totally makes sense. It's the same thing with white cars. I always say this, white cars aren't white. Neither are black cars. They reflect all of the color around them, especially if it's a street car and not something that has a wrap on it like the race cars do. So I did, um, for Obsessed Garage, I did Matt Mormon's 997 GT3. Um, and it's gray black. But when I was mixing the color, it's not actually gray. It was almost purple in some regards like a really rich purple that was muted and then on the flip side there was a set of grays i made that was almost green and mm. i think the best example overall is if you look at the whittington brothers 935 i did the one that's at night um getting ready to go into the horseshoe at daytona the car is brown those are all browns that i painted the car in but it gives the illusion of being yellow because of that bright yellow stripe on the top from the lights overhead and it being at night, obviously. That was a real um, exercise in color theory. Like I was sitting there going, are you sure it's brown? Like just, you just have to trust the process sometimes. Like just let go and trust the process. Right, <laughs> yeah, no, I get that, yeah. Well, now I said we met at Amelia, so what, like some, some of the shows you're doing, or where can people find you in person to see some of these works of art? So this season, I am, the latter half of my year is a little up in the air, but for the beginning of this year, I will be down at Targa 66 this weekend coming up, actually. Um, so I'll be there on Friday. It's down at Homestead. James and Brian Redman put that on. It's a historic racing event, if you will. Um, my next event that I'll be at is going to be in St. Petersburg at the Firestone Grand Prix. We're putting together, or not we're, I'm putting together a uh, gallery show with a charity called Cart for Kids. Um, they're a nonprofit and all the proceeds from them go directly to Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Um, so we're doing a little gallery show in downtown St. Pete at the James Museum of Western Art, Western and Wildlife Art during the week of the Grand Prix. After that, I'll be at Sebring for the 12 hour, um, okay. which I'm the official poster artist of this year, which nice. is very exciting. Yep. Um, I'm the first woman to ever do a poster, an official poster for Sebring, if not IMSA. Which is pretty wow, cool. that's I very think, cool. I think so. <laughs> We're gonna I say you are. <laughs> okay, deal. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll be at Sebring, and then thereafter, I'm not quite sure yet. This year, I'm taking off from Amelia. I'll be down at Moto running around though, at the very minimum. And uh, okay, but yeah, so I'll see you in a few weeks, right? Yeah. Exactly. I just saw you yeah. down at Catalina. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I also noticed on your website, and I did not know this because I haven't actually opened them up yet, but you did a lot of the artwork for the Brumos books. I, well, yeah. For the uh, We did a project on the um, uh, slipcase with Sean Cridland. 
So, yeah, this book. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wonderful set of books. Honestly, I had so much fun pawing through those. I Before we started that project with Sean, I think I spent maybe about two weeks reading through almost the entire set, which is a ton of reading. But Sean is a fantastic storyteller. I had a great time reading that. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, well, before we get on, because I did want to talk to you about AI in the art world, because I know you, there's some crazy stuff going on there. Is there anything else you wanted to mention just about your work in general or where you'll be? Don't you have a surprise announcement you're going to tell yes, me about? Yes, the Porsche, the Porsche thing, thing I was going to say, yes. yeah. So um, if you're on Instagram, I just did a special project with two friends of mine, Ray Roberts and Sonny Combs, and they're also automotive artists. And we teamed up with Porsche USA to do a little Instagram campaign for Valentine's Day. So I did a frozen berry metallic 992 GT3 R. So Porsche's new iteration of their GT3 car. Sunny did a Ruby Stone GT4. And Ray did the front of a 911, which was pretty neat. So I have to check so those out. As this is, what's today, the 12th? And this will come out on the 15th. Mm -hmm. When is this posted? This will or be post posted on Valentine's Day. On Valentine's Day. Okay. Yeah. So I will I will also include those pictures if you're watching on YouTube. And then I'll have a link to your profile in the description. Okay, cool. That's awesome. I love the timing of this. This works out great. Okay. So artificial intelligence in the art world. I know that's crazy. Mm -hmm. My only exposure to it right now is I remember one of the Marvel TV sitcoms. Not sitcoms. So one of the Marvel TV shows... They had the AI artwork at the beginning and the end. I remember that made the news. Mm -hmm. So tell us all about it and your stance, because I'm against it. I can tell you right now. So, <laughs> so this is um, a hill I will die on. I am. I have some feelings about AI. So first and foremost, when you're looking at AI generated anything, it's a program that has been put together to sample certain amounts of information and compile it based on whatever your prompt is. So for instance, AI artwork. When you go to these AI generators um, and you type in a prompt, um, say like, oh, I want a you know, 356 on a beach that's got a sunset, whatever and it spits out an image, the way that it creates the AI generated image is it samples other images that are already out there or artwork that's already out there and pieces a picture together like a puzzle. But it does this without permission from the artist or photographer. So wow. AI literally steals artwork and imagery from other people. And it's horrible because, you know, we live in such a fast paced world now where everybody says, hey, it's cheaper for me to just have a computer do it like this, this and this, or, you know, it's easy for me to just whip out some quick content for social media by putting it in an AI generator. But by doing so, you're literally robbing people, creatives, artists, photographers, authors, anybody in the creative field, you're literally taking money out of their hand based off of using uh, some prompt in a machine and code that's been put together. And the biggest issue I've seen recently, especially going into the more automotive world, um, automotive related artwork, people have been creating AI generated images, printing them on canvas and trying to pass them off as original artwork. Wow. Okay. It's awful. And I've seen it for sale, not only on Instagram, not only on Facebook and in groups, but I've seen it for sale on auction websites that we know, like you can include this if you want to. I've seen it for sale. Raised the flag to him multiple times, including not only myself, but so many other artists saying, no, 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 this isn't real art. This is literally made by a computer and someone's trying to pass it off as their own work. And right, right. it's so disheartening that 
people not only from an artist perspective but from a client perspective that they get hosed thinking they're getting an original piece of artwork and the fact that it's literally taking business opportunities out of our hands it's not only you know clients like close clients either it's also corporate bmw just did a little um over Christmas time, just did a little campaign with using AI generated images and their new, I don't know, it was like a 320, I don't know what it was. Anyway, so they did photos and then they had reindeer in the background that had like seven legs, like Chernobyl reindeer. <laughs> and everybody in the comments was going, what are you doing? Honestly, just hire an editor. It'll take them five minutes to put in real reindeer, not, you know, nuclear bomb right. reindeer. So right. just, yeah. it's so frustrating and it's so sad to see that it's happening within that space. And I think it's really important for people to be able to understand and differentiate between true artwork and stuff that's been printed out and trying to be passed off as real artwork. I did a whole little like video or whatever on how to be able to distinguish AI generated art versus real artwork. Um, some of the best advice I can give you is if you look at, if it's something that's got numbers or lettering on it, 99% of the time that lettering will look jumbled. Like it doesn't make out words. It doesn't make any sense. Mm. And then secondly, if you look at, um, there's a certain type of style that's like that real painterly, like thick brush stroke, almost impasto looking style. That's pretty common with that. Um, logos don't look right. So for instance, the Porsche crest, it will look right. Um, most important piece of advice I can give though, is to talk to the artist, get in right. touch with whoever created it and ask them about their process Hey, you know, did you paint this? Did you draw this? Is this a digitally created, digitally painted piece? Because I do some of that, but it's just, uh, it's so frustrating seeing people trying to almost take the easy way out and not hire or commission or work with real artists, but instead steal from them to right. do it yeah. for pennies on the dollar. You know. Right. Just making a buck. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm glad you brought it up. If you could send me that link to your video that kind of goes sure. through that. I'll add that as well, because that's yeah. something to be wary of, because you're going to lose great artists like yourself, because it just yeah. makes it even more hard, more difficult to earn a living. Right. Definitely. Well, I think it is and it isn't. I think the um, counterpoint is, is, is there a place for AI? Sure. I think that there's some you know, reasonable applications for it. For instance, if you need a reference photo that doesn't exist. So you have a car, but the background isn't what you want. If you want to change the background, sure. I do it myself in Photoshop, but you know, and right. I'll paw through the Revs Institute archives for days and get in touch with them and see if they have anything for me. Um, I think that that is a good application for it, but anything else, I just, I think it boils down to being lazy and trying to, you know, make as much money as you can for as little effort. Yeah. Um, right. And yeah, and it really just goes back to people getting taken advantage of. And I don't want to see people being taken advantage of in that space, in our space, especially. And something else I've also noticed is car design. There's been a few instances now where I've seen someone who is a car designer and tries to coin that he's designing these cars, but they don't quite look like there's something that's been designed by hand. It kind of seems like they've just been spat out of one of those AI generated, you know, prompts. Right. So I tip my hat to Horacio, Horacio Pagani for staying true to that and being a true craftsman in that regard as well. And right. Portia as well in their ye old fashioned clay modeling, which I love. <laughs> it's so cool. Yeah, that is very cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate it. That's a great 
a great thing to communicate out to folks that might not know. I was not aware of that. So I'm sure yeah. my listeners are not. So thanks for educating us on AI art. That's crazy. Sure. Well, what's the best way for our listeners to follow you and learn more about you? Obviously, I mentioned the website, but what's your IG handle and other fun stuff? So you can find me on pretty much all the social media, um, though I try not to spend my entire life on them. <laughs> Hard these days. But you can find me at Zimmy underscore arts. Or you can also find me on Facebook, Samantha Zimmerman Fine Arts. We have my website, samanthazimmermanart.com. Um, that's got all my information on it as well. But otherwise, you can find me out and about in that list of <laughs> events I have growing for this season. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on the Collector Car Podcast. And I'll see you a f in a few weeks, right, at Moda. Yes, sir. You'll see me there. All right. Thanks, Samantha. Thank you so much, Greg.